downtown St. Louis, a monument marks our city as the gateway to the West, hearkening back to 19th century explorers who made their way to the newly acquired Louisiana Purchase. And in a similar way, the, the city that we're going to talk about today in Acts is the gateway. It was known as the gateway to Europe. It was the gateway to Europe because in ancient times, it was situated across the Aegean Sea from present-day Turkey. But even more importantly for our purposes and assessment, it, it was a gateway for the gospel to go from the Middle East in the early church to Europe to take the message of the hope of Jesus Christ. The city is Philippi, and the section of the New Testament we're in is Acts chapter 16. If you want to open your Bibles to Acts chapter 16. We've been studying Acts, and if you remember the last Sunday that we were in Acts was the end of June. So it's been quite a while since we've been in our journey through Acts. After a short, a few shorter messages uh, series, we did the verse that changes every, changed everything and created to connect. And now we're moving into a new section in Luke's account of the early church. So the followers of Jesus had expanded from just a small band of disciples in Jerusalem to this flourishing movement that's gone throughout the the area around Judea. And uh, the movement had gained a lot of attention, even in spite of persecution, in spite of opposition and all kinds of challenges. At the end of, or in Acts chapter 15, there was an issue that came up that all of the leaders met together to resolve regarding circumcision. The question had been brought up, do people need to be circumcised as Jews would in order to be in the Christian church, as we would call it. They settled that matter in Acts chapter 15. And then Barnabas and Paul, who'd been co-workers for a long time, had a little bit of a disagreement about another co-worker named John Mark. And Barnabas wanted to bring John Mark along on the next leg of their journey, and Paul didn't. And so they had a disagreement. It ended up with Barnabas uh, taking John Mark and going to Cyprus while Paul and Silas who was a leader in the Jerusalem church, joined together, and they went through uh, Syria and Cilicia, strengthening the churches there. And then early in Acts chapter 16, after Paul and Silas picked up another young disciple named Timothy, we read this in Acts 16, starting with verse 9. That night, Paul had a vision. A man from Macedonia in northern Greece was standing there pleading with him, come over to Macedonia and help us. So we decided to leave for Macedonia at once, having concluded that God was calling us to preach the good news there. Now, this experience illustrates how God did things and how God does things for us. Uh, the principle that we need to be reminded of is this is the spread of the gospel, that the whole story of Acts is taking the message of the hope of Jesus Christ to Judea, Samaria, to the uttermost parts of the world. And this is what's happening in this story. There are people all over the world who are looking for meaning, looking for hope, looking for purpose, trying to connect with the divine and doing whatever they can to figure that out, whether it's the world religions that we can find here that try to come up with answers or some kind of uh, exercise, fitness, some kind of alcohol, drugs, that extra piece of pie in the fridge after dinner. I mean, we, we search all kinds of places for meaning, for purpose, for something in life. And what this passage shows us is this vision that Paul had of this man in Macedonia of saying, come and help me. And God tapped Paul on the shoulder and said, I want to connect you, my disciple, with this one who was searching. And there are people all over the world that are still trying to connect we call these unreached, unengaged people groups in many settings. There, there are still a lot of unreached groups around the world that if, if nobody goes to them with the gospel, there's no gospel witness in their midst. And so it makes sense that God uses supernatural means like visions to take people into that group because if no one goes to them, they're not going to have the gospel. And it also fits that the New Testament would, that God would hear the cry of people that are searching for him. And then he would use us who are followers of Jesus to connect with them throughout our world in Australia, Asia, Africa, other parts of the world. There are people that are crying for hope. 
And God wants to use us, mobilize us and mobilize his church around the world to meet that need. I believe that the spirit includes all kinds of information for this. There are a couple of websites I want to share with you that you can learn more. One is called the Joshua Project. If you want to find out more of unreached people groups around the world, the status of unreached people groups, the number of unreached people groups, how you can pray for unreached people groups all around the world, go to the Joshua Project website. It's an amazing source of information. Another website is called Global Gates. And Global Gates is interesting because it's, it tracks unreached people groups here in the United States, where there have been groups that have immigrated to the United States and settled here in our country, and who, if no one goes into them, there's no gospel presence or very little gospel presence. On their list in Global, on Global Gates website, there are two groups right here in St. Louis, including one of the largest population of Hindus in Baldwin, Missouri. Baldwin, Missouri, and the Hindu population right on our doorstep is on this website as an unreached people group that if nobody goes to them with the gospel, they're not going to hear. Remember all along in our study of Acts, we've talked about this as it's a narrative study, so it's descriptive, not necessarily prescriptive, but it's giving us transferable principles that we need to apply in our own lives, in our ministry. And Luke is telling us what's happened here. Well, I believe that God can and does use visions when he needs to use visions to move people. I also know that on this side of the cross and with the Bible that I have right in front of me, that I probably don't need very many special visions from God to know what I ought to be doing that there's probably a lot that I know I'm ought to be doing that I don't do already. It's just following what God's word says. I don't think you and I need a special vision to go to that person across the office who's going through a hard time. I don't think we need to have some special vision from God to go to that neighbor who we know is struggling and suffering. I'm not saying God can't or God won't. I'm just saying we have plenty of direction right now to do that. Matthew chapter nine, Jesus instructed his followers to pray that God would send workers into the field because the fields are already prepared for harvest. It's not even pray that God would send workers in the field and start getting the planting done or start getting all the work done. It's like, no, it's ready. Just go, just go pray that they would go. And how hypocritical would it be for me to pray that God would send workers into the harvest and send you out there and not also make myself available. Say, God, send workers into the harvest field and we all need to be available to go Perhaps the person you work with or the person you live near, someone in your sphere of influence is going through some crisis or problem, and in their own way, they're crying out to God for help. They're praying just like that man in Macedonia, help me, help me. And God is saying to me and to you, I want to use you to be the answer to this person's prayer. That's as complicated as this gets, really? I mean, that's it, isn't it? That God wants to use me and you to share the hope that we found in Christ with people that are looking. So let's jump back into Acts, verse six, uh, verses 11 and 12 of Acts 16. This is uh, how Paul uh, and his team continue. We boarded the boat at Troas and sailed straight across to the island of Samothrace, and the next day we landed in Neapolis. From there we reached Philippi, a major city of that district in Macedonia and a Roman colony. And we stayed there for several days. Now notice, and this is it's kind of subtle. It sneaks in there. All of a sudden it's we. So Luke actually joined the team here. And it's sort of understated, but it's critical. And it's kind of cool to know the story that Luke is giving us firsthand accounts here that he joined. So the team is now Paul and Silas and Timothy and Luke in this section. Here's a map that's showing the journey across the Aegean Sea. So from Troas, past Samothrace, Neapolis to the city of Philippi. This is the spread of the gospel from the Middle East into the continent of Europe. Philippi was an ancient city named in the fourth century uh, BC for Philip of Macedon. He was the father of Alexander the Great. 
It came under Roman domination in 168 BC and became a Roman colony uh, in 31 BC under Octavian. The Roman influence is really important as we see what happens in this part of the gospel. And by the way, as you read the letter of Philippians that Paul wrote to the church in Philippi, you, you need to read and understand Philippi as a Roman dominated city in the way it functioned and in its philosophy. So let's look at the first uh, experience that this team had in Philippi in verse 13. On the Sabbath, we went a little way outside the city to a riverbank where we thought some people would be meeting for prayer. We sat down to speak with some of them who had gathered there. One of them was Lydia from Thyatira, a merchant of expensive purple cloth who worshiped God. As she listened to us, the Lord opened her heart and she accepted what Paul was saying. She and her household were baptized, and she asked us to be her guest. If you agree that I'm a true believer in the Lord, she said, come and stay at my home. And she urged us until we agreed. So the team, which had obviously been preparing this whole ship ride over to Philippi, had been preparing and praying and had this vision that was driving them to take the gospel, the good news of Jesus, to these people who didn't have it. And they got there, and they didn't jump into business right away. They just settled in for a few days, which I think that alone is a good principle for us. When people aren't projects, by the way, where they didn't come in and say, okay, we need to get our stats here. How many, how many people are we witnessing to every day? And going, so, no, we need to know people. We need to know their story. We need to know who we're talking to. We need to know how they do things and why they do what they do. So they waited for a few days and then started Paul's normal pattern. And his normal pattern when he was in a new city was to find a synagogue, some place to go where the Jewish worship took place. And this was probably for a few reasons. One, he wanted to reach Jews with the gospel. He wanted to take the gospel to his own people uh, and they, they would be in the synagogue or in the Jewish place of worship. Secondly, it probably was where Christ followers gathered. It was the known place since, since Christianity came out of a Jewish context. They still went to the synagogue. They still did Jewish kinds of practices with their worship of God in their meetings. And then third, probably most important is Paul and the team knew that that's the kind of place that people gather when they're looking for spiritual answers. They're going to places of prayer. They're, they're looking at spiritual kinds of things. And it was a place for them to come and to encounter them. So there's apparently no Jewish synagogue in Philippi. Uh, there needed to be 10 Jewish men to form a synagogue. So there obviously wasn't enough for that. And, but they learned that there was this prayer gathering outside the city, near a river, and there might have been no Jews present. Maybe there were no Jews in this community at all. And Paul and the team go to this river, and they find no Jews present, but only Gentile God-fearers. These are Gentile people who were sympathetic with the Judeo-Christian message, and especially with kind of Hellenistic Judaism in some way. So Paul and his team join this prayer gathering, and they're, they're watching, and this is important for us, they're, they're watching to see who is it that God has put in this group that I can connect with, who maybe has a heart for God, who's open to spiritual things. And they were drawn to this successful businesswoman named Lydia, she was particularly interested in the gospel. She was particularly interested in the message of Jesus. And the description in this verse points to a really wealthy, successful woman. This region was a center of the purple dye trade and purple, purple dyed material was incredibly expensive. It was the color of royalty. And she traded and dealt in goods that were dyed purple. And so she worshiped God to the point that she could with what she knew, but there was something she was still looking for. And when she heard Paul and Silas and Timothy and Luke talking about the change that had happened in their lives and talking about the life of Jesus and his death and resurrection and the hope that we can have in him and how we can be children of God, and the whole gospel message, it's really clear that she just latched onto that which is, is really important for us. Paul didn't have to manufacture that and make that happen. And sometimes I think we're afraid that if we start 
witnessing to people, if we start a relationship with someone far from God, what's the next step we need to do for them? You know, what's the next thing we need to do to get them closer to God? Nothing. It's the Holy Spirit's actually doing this whole thing. So we just need to be there and be faithful to share the testimony of what God's done in our hearts and to let them lead and guide the way. Let them lead and guide the way in their search. Let their questions guide the way of how you interact with them. So what we see here is that she was baptized in her household after she embraced the gospel. And by the way, we, we often see and we read sometimes the, and their household, and we need to know what does that mean? Uh, probably it means all of the people, the servants, maybe the family members. We don't need to go so far as to say, okay, this is infant baptism because all the babies were baptized. The, the text doesn't say that. And it seems like the rest of the New Testament says in Acts also that there's a profession of faith that accompanies saving faith and, and that transformation that happens in our lives. Um, but to, to whatever degree that this whole family, this whole household, all of her servants and all of her family were baptized and became Christian. And after embracing Christ, she implores the missionary team to stay with her, and they agree. And it seems like she had to kind of urge them to. Maybe they were a little bit resistant at first, but it's like, no, she wants them to stay. And she had enough influence that she got them to stay. And in the letter of Philippians, Paul praises the generosity of this church. And I wonder if it didn't start with Lydia. The DNA of a generous faith was a really successful businesswoman whose life was transformed by Jesus. And she was the, the founder of this church then met in her home and generosity became part of how this church worked. It also reminds us, and we need to keep our eyes out as we go through acts of the significant role that women played in the early church. We get to, in addition to Lydia, we're going to read in Acts 17 about the women of Thessalonica the women in Berea, Damaris in Athens, Priscilla in Corinth, and Lydia and Priscilla are especially described as leaders in the church. And we need, to, we need to note that. It seems like Lydia's house became the home base for this work. And certainly while there was the influence of the Roman world, the Greco-Roman culture that elevated women in their society, even more so was the message of Paul that in Christ there's neither male nor female. And we need to learn from that. And women are gifted to serve in the church. And we want to embrace that. So Lydia's encounter with God provides very important transformational and transferable kind of principles for us. Paul and his team were motivated by a vision to take the good news of Jesus to people who didn't, who didn't have it. And they trusted that God, they trusted enough to get on a boat and go without knowing exactly who and where and what. And as they were going, they encountered Lydia when they arrived at their destination after spending time there and getting acclimated, they found this person who was searching for the message of salvation. So here are a few questions for us. Are we praying for our neighbors, for our coworkers? Are we praying for the the people we go to school with? Are we praying for the people we work out with at the gym? Are we praying for the people that we associate with in any circles that we're in? Are we praying and are we expecting God to bring us into, into some kind of close proximity and conversation with people that are far from God? And are we watching and asking the Holy Spirit to give us a sensitivity to someone who might be searching for something that we might have the answer to in Christ? Who is God bringing into your path this week so that you could begin a relationship to be an influence for Christ? And again, we don't, we don't need to over um, complicate this. It's being the man and woman of God that he wants you to be. And he's already preparing someone who needs to hear the message that you have to give. We'll talk a little bit more about that in just a moment. So the story then takes a really interesting turn in verse 16 in Acts chapter 16. The team was on their way again to another place, of, to the place of prayer. And they encountered a girl who was a slave possessed by a spirit that gave her the ability to predict the future. 
The Greek is literally translated a uh, python spirit. The, the python spirit came from a Delphic oracle in, in uh, the Greek god Apollo. And th- this is the world that we're in, the world that, that Paul and his team were taking the gospel into, full of gods, full of divinity kinds of talk. And so this, this girl was possessed by a spirit called a python spirit, and she was following Paul and his team around. Verse 17 says she would follow them around and shout, these men are servants of the most high God and they've come to tell you how to be saved. Now we don't know why or what that was. Was that the demon inside of her was just couldn't help but announce that this is what was happening here because this demon recognized that this was the hand of God coming? Um, Was she trying to annoy them because it appears like that's what happened? It's kind of humorous that Paul just gets fed up with it. He doesn't like, his motivation doesn't seem to be, I want to cast this demon out of you. It's like, I'm tired of you annoying us. And boom, here we go. And this demon is cast out of her. And then immediately we see what was going on here. So after he spoke and said, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out, she was delivered. Verse 19, her master's hopes of wealth were now shattered because she was predicting the future for people. So they grabbed Paul and Silas and dragged them before the authorities in the marketplace. The whole city is in an uproar because of these Jews. They shouted to the city officials, they're teaching customs that are illegal for us Romans to practice. A mob quickly formed against Paul and Silas and the city officials ordered them stripped and beaten with wooden rods. They were severely beaten and then they were thrown into prison. The jailer was ordered to make sure they didn't escape. So the jailer put them into the inner dungeon and clamped their feet in stocks. Now, the excavations of the city of Philippi show this marketplace, uh, the Agora, it's called. It's been uncovered. And on one side is a raised platform where the tribunal would sit and adjudicate cases like this. And interestingly, the reason that Paul and Silas, and for some reason, Luke and Timothy were not arrested. It was just Paul and Silas, the text tells us. But the real reason was because they cast the demon out of this girl, and so the master couldn't make money from her. But that's not what came out in court. What came out in court was that they were teaching customs that were illegal for Romans. And we don't know what specifically they were teaching. Was it the Lord's Supper? Was it the resurrection of Jesus? There were all kinds of spiritual divinity kinds of things floating around. So it doesn't seem like that. Maybe they were just disrupting the Pax Romana. The, the, the peace of Rome was being disrupted. They were not doing Roman kinds of things and they wanted to bring this up. So at any rate, they were labeled and they labeled them as Jews. There was definitely some prejudice going on there. Romans aren't supposed to do this. These Jews are coming in. So there was some bigotry included as well. They were stripped and beaten. And in verse 25, we read how Paul and Silas responded to this unjust treatment. Around midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. And the other prisoners were listening. What a response. Unjustly arrested trumped up charges that weren't true, beaten, put in prison. It's time to praise God. It's time to sing hymns. It's time, it's time to glorify God so that the other people in the prison will hear. What a response to suffering. We need to be reminded from this story that joy in the midst of suffering is a hallmark characteristic of the followers of Jesus. Having joy in the midst of suffering, injustice, wrongly accused is a hallmark characteristic of the followers of Jesus. Romans chapter five, verse three, we can rejoice too when we run into problems and trials For we know that they help us develop endurance. James chapter 1 verse 2. Dear brothers and sisters, when troubles of any kind come your way, consider it an opportunity for joy. 1 Peter 5, 6. 
So humble yourselves under the mighty power of God, and at the right time, he will lift you up. Luke adds that the other prisoners were listening to Paul and Silas, and undoubtedly, they were equally confused by their reaction to the suffering. Who goes to prison and doesn't just try to justify themselves and rail against the injustice, rail against the charges, rail against the authorities that are abusing them? Who does that? The world tells us fight back, defend, rail against unjust treatment. But sometimes, friends, trusting in God involves enduring injustice, pain, suffering, loss, with the hope and faith that we have in Christ. What if, what if God wants others to find him through your response to suffering? What if God wants other people to encounter him in a saving way through your through watching and hearing you respond to adversity and suffering in your life. Are we available to that? Do we say, God, yeah, let's do that. That's what happened here. While they were praising God, then an earthquake shook the prison. The doors were opened. The chains fell off. The racket woke up the jailer who responded to find the doors open. He assumed that everyone had escaped, so he was ready to take his own life because he would be put to death if all the prisoners escaped under his watch. And Paul stopped him in verse 28 and assured him that no one had escaped. Now, I need to pause. There's a lot of questions I have about this section. I mean, there seems to be a lot left out here. I mean, okay, it was dark. He didn't see. How did you know the jailer was dead? going to kill himself if he ends up turning the lights on to come and find you? You Why didn't everybody leave when the doors were open? I just have a lot of questions that this passage doesn't answer, and I'm just going to say that. But what we do see is this earthquake happened. Paul tells the jailer, people didn't run out. The jailer's response likely flows out of hearing their praise knowing what their charges had been and that they're still here even though the doors are open and there's something really unusual about how they're responding to this whole thing. And it all came together and brought the jailer to the end of himself. And in chapter 16, verses 29 and 30, the jailer called for the lights and ran into the dungeon and fell down trembling before Paul and Silas. He brought them out and asked, sirs, what must I do to be saved? What must I do to be saved? How do I get what you have? How do I know this God who you are worshiping? They replied in verse 31, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved along with everyone in your household. And they shared the word of the Lord with him and with all who lived in his household. They made it clear that the message wasn't just for the jailer. It was for everyone in his family, everyone in his household. Saving faith wasn't automatically passed down. They went and they shared the good news with him. Somehow the jailer was able to take them to his home. Paul and Silas shared the word of the Lord with them for hours after this encounter. And verse 33 says that they were all baptized. Isn't that cool? I mean, this is just happening. They're encountering Christ, coming into their home, sharing the word of the Lord with the family, everyone embracing God. And now let's find the water and let's be baptized. And we can't, we can't get away from the amazing picture and imagery of everyone being washed in that home, right? Paul and Silas were washed of their wounds of being beaten. The jailer and his family were washed of their sins through through salvation and baptism. Everybody was washed. That's what God's wanting here. He's wanting them to be clean. He's wanting them to know the hope that is found in Jesus. And the text goes on to explain the joy that the jailer has in his newfound faith. At some point, the jailer must have taken them back to prison. And Luke doesn't give us, again, many details. So if you're a detailed person, there's just a lot in this story. It's like, boy, I would wonder how, how this actually happened back into prison. And then the magistrates who beat and imprisoned Paul and Silas, they heard and got news of the earthquake and everything that had happened and probably were feeling a little bit scared right now. So they just said, just release them and let them go. 
It seems like they wanted to downplay the situation and just let them leave quietly and get this thing over with. But we read in verses 37 and 39 that Paul pumped the brakes on that and said, no, you're not going to do that. You're not going to get away with that. Which is, it's interesting because earlier they praised God at the injustice of being beaten and imprisoned. But something is different in this situation because in this situation, the magistrates are saying, you guys go ahead and go. Let's just say, say we're even. And Paul basically says, no, actually we're not. We're not going to just go. We want you to walk us to the door. And the text doesn't explain this, but I think what might be happening, this is just what I think might be happening, is this is the new, new thing. The gospel is just coming into Philippi. So the, these people who are embracing the gospel and are followers of Jesus are the only ones. And I wonder if what Paul was trying to make clear is, if you just let us go, then everyone else could be mistreated. But if you walk us to the door, that will be a public declaration of what you did was wrong. And that is not an appropriate way to treat people who are embracing Jesus Christ. So it was something of a safety for all of the other followers of Jesus who are coming or people who are coming to Christ, because it was a statement now asking them, uh, not, not asking, not allowing them to mistreat them. Speculation, but uh, possibly that's what Paul was trying to do. And verse 40 tells us what they did next. After Paul and Silas came out of prison, they went to Lydia's house where they met with the brothers and sisters and encouraged them. And then they left. So Lydia, the slave girl, the jailer, Paul and, Paul and Silas and Timothy and Luke were available to God to say, I'm going to go. And as I'm going, God, you bring me into contact with people who are searching. And in this first stop, there's Lydia, the slave girl. We don't know much about what happened after her, but I can't imagine she didn't like enjoy being free from the demons that were possessing her and the salvation that she had in Christ and the jailer. They had what Leslie Newbegin, who was, a who was a missionary and a churchman in England many years ago, called a missionary encounter with God. And the culture there in Philippi had a missionary encounter with God. Newbegin said, the only way anyone will believe the gospel is if there's a church that believes it and lives by it. The only way anyone will believe the gospel is if there's a church that believes it and lives by it. Believing and living by the gospel takes us into neighborhoods, takes us into brokenness, takes us into places where people are addicted to drugs, takes us into places where families are broken, takes us into prisons, takes us into all the, all the messed up places of the world where people are searching. When we engage our community and prayerfully watch for people who are interested in spiritual things, the power of God steps in and he does what he does. He helps us to bump into people that need the hope that we have in Jesus. Around us, there are people crying out for help. There are people crying out for hope. There are people who need a purpose in life, who need acceptance, who are searching for something for hope and salvation. And God wants to use each one of us to answer that call. Just a few things that I want to challenge you to do in the coming days. Will you pray for the people around you, your neighbors, your coworkers, students at school you go to school with, for people in your circles, your family? Will you, will you start praying and ask God to direct you to people who are open to spiritual things? Ask, you, ask God to like help you to connect with people that are searching. And then here's the big one. Test it. When you, when you think maybe you're talking to someone who's hurting and they might be open, test it and see. If the Holy Spirit's in this, God will lead it and they're going to lead you right where they need to be. Here's how you test it. Low hanging fruit. Hey, can I pray for you about that? If they say yes, it's like, okay, then you go to that next step. Test it. Or another test might be, wow, you know, here's, here's how I've experienced some hope in my life when I've been going through some hard things. Can I share that with you? Or testing it might be, you know what? I'm part of a men's 
Bible study or women's Bible study, or I have a small group that meets at my house every Thursday, and we're all about trying to figure this life out and how to deal with this stuff. You want to come? You want to come to church? You want to join me? Or maybe, maybe do you want to have coffee and just talk because I'm interested in you? Will you do that? Will you trust that God actually wants us to do that? And in doing that, he's going to bring us to people just like he did to Paul in Acts chapter 16. Let's pray and ask God to make that real. Father, this is a really exciting chapter in Acts. As we see the gospel going from, from just Jerusalem and Judea and the area right in the Middle East, across the Aegean Sea to people that have not heard. And it reminds us and convicts us because there are people all around us in our neighborhoods and communities and workplaces who don't know you, who are asking questions. So will you, we, we want to make ourselves available first. God, we want to be a church and a people who are available that if you have someone in this community, someone in our sphere of influence who is asking questions, we want to be available to you to tap us on the shoulder and to take us to them. And then we pray that you would help us to get out of the way and allow your Holy Spirit to do what you do, which is to share the good news and the hope of Jesus Christ with them. We pray this in your name. Amen. I'm going to invite servers and others who are helping with communion today to come forward. Before we have the Lord's Supper, um, one of my heroes of the faith is a 19th century Scottish Presbyterian pastor, Robert Murray McShane. He said that the Lord's Supper is the sweetest of all the ordinances. And he gave three reasons why I want to share with you. He said, first, it's the sweetest of all the ordinances because of the time that it was instituted. It was at the night of his betrayal that Jesus shared the bread and the cup with his disciples. He said, there's never been a darker night, one when his love was put to the test more. How amazing that on that dark night in his life, he would think about our comfort. He would think about our hope. And second, because it's the believer's ordinance. He said, God calls on all people to pray. God wants everyone to be saved. But the Lord's Supper is the children's bread. It's intended only for those who know and love Jesus. And third, because Christ is the beginning, the middle, and the end of it. Do this in remembrance of me. He's the beginning of it. And he also says, when you do this, you show the Lord's death until he comes. He's the end of it. Christ is the Alpha and the Omega of the Lord's Supper. It is all Christ and it's all him crucified. And these things, McShane said, give this a peculiar sweetness of all that we do. And he went on to say that receiving the bread and the wine means that I do thankfully receive the broken, bleeding Savior as my surety. The act of taking the bread and the wine is an appropriating act. It's saying before God, angels, men, and devils, that I do flee to the Lord Jesus Christ as my refuge. And so together, when we come to this table, we are declaring our dependence upon him. We're declaring he is our refuge, and we run to him. So if you've experienced salvation through Jesus Christ in your own life, you're welcome to join us at this table, whether you are part of our church or not, you're part of the family of God, this is our meal. If you're not, if you're still wrestling with the truth claims of Jesus and you're not sure what to do with this, we're glad you're here. I ask you to just let the tray pass and think about and pray about the things that we've been talking about here. When you get the trays, they'll be passed down the aisle. There's a stack of two cups with the bread in the lower cup and the juice in the top. You can take a stack of cups and there are gluten-free wafers in the center of the tray. And while the elements are being passed, I just invite you to, to quiet your own soul and ask that the Holy Spirit would impress on you and speak to you about whatever he needs to talk to you today about. Maybe something in our praise song, something in our sermon today, maybe conviction of some part of your life that needs to be corrected. Just let the Holy Spirit talk to you as these elements are served, and then we'll take them together. So hold the elements until everyone is served. Matthew relates in his gospel that during the meal, Jesus took and blessed the bread. He broke it and he gave it to his disciples and said, 
take and eat. This is my body. Let's eat the bread together. And then taking the cup and giving thanks to God, he gave it to them. Drink this, all of you. This is my blood, God's new covenant, poured out for many people for the forgiveness of sins. Let's drink together. And then he gave the most hopeful words, I think, that we could hear. He said, I'll not be drinking wine from this cup again until that new day when I'll drink it with you in the kingdom of my father. 